بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Continuing with our journey of Islamic manners and good character. Today we're speaking about the topic of the mannerisms pertaining to seeking knowledge. The manners that a student of knowledge must have or should have. This will become more and more clear and in, in terms of how important it is as we go through the reminder. Because you may be thinking, how can it be that somebody seeking knowledge needs to study manners? But this is something which was known from the Salaf, that they would advise their students that before you go and seek knowledge from a scholar, you seek manners from the scholar. You sit with the Sheikh and you learn the manners pertaining to interacting with knowledge itself. Because knowledge, as we're going to come to know in a moment, is something which is so lofty and valuable and so high in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that it cannot be blemished by bad character of the one that is trying to carry it. So the one that is seeking it and trying to carry it and convey it, he or she needs to know how lofty and how valuable what they are carrying is. And that will then lead them to try to have good character and not to try to blemish what they're carrying in any way, shape or form. It's as though you are representing a king or you're representing somebody who in your heart has a lot of virtue. You will always speak about that person and represent that person in the best way possible. Likewise, the one who is seeking knowledge, he will have characteristics and mannerisms so that he or she can represent that knowledge in the best way possible. So the Prophet Sallallahu for example, mentioned in Tirmidhi that he said, Man salaka tariqan yaltamisu fihi ilm, sahalallahu lahu tariqan ilal jannah. Whoever seeks a path therein, looking for knowledge, then Allah will make that path for him easy to jannah. Al jaza'u min jinsil amal. The reward is recompensed compared to the action. So the action of you seeking knowledge is because you want to get close to Allah and get to Jannah. So Allah makes your path to Jannah easy. And the hadith says, وَإِنَّ الْمَلَائِكَ لَا تَدَعُوا أَجْنِحَتِهَا لِطَالِبَ الْإِلْمِ رِضًا بِمَا يَصْنَعُ And verily the angels for this person who is on this path of seeking knowledge, they lower their wings out of pleasure and humility because of what the seeker of knowledge is doing. So you can imagine that when you see a celebrity walking in the streets, everybody's crowding around that celebrity. Everybody's trying to take pictures and get an autograph. Whereas you, when you are walking to seek knowledge, the angels are gathering around you. The angels are trying to get your autograph. The angels are pleased with you. The angels are lowering their wings out of mercy and humility and pleasure for what you are doing. So try to bring that to mind. And the hadith continues that it says, And very the scholar, Seeks for him forgiveness, everything which is in the heavens and the earth, even the fish which are found in the sea. So everything in creation is seeking forgiveness for this person. Why? Because this person who truly seeks knowledge and truly preaches it is bringing good to the creation. Is bringing justice to the creation. Is bringing tawheed to the creation. And everything on earth will benefit from that. From the human being to the trees to the fish to everything that lives on earth benefits from the knowledge which is being sought and imparted. And the hadith goes on. And it said, إِنَّ الْعُلَمَاء وَإِنَّ الْعَالِمْ وَإِنَّ الْفَضْلُ الْعَالِمْ عَلَى الْعَابِدْ كَفَضْلُ الْقَمْرِ عَلَى سَائِرِ الْكَوَاكِبِ And verily, the virtue of the scholar as compared to the worshipper, the normal worshipper, is like the virtue of the sun, or the virtue of the moon in its brightness compared to the rest of the stars. So what do you see the most brightest in the night? What is the one that catches your attention? It's the moon, as compared to the stars. Likewise, this is the virtue of the scholar. He stands above and he shines above the rest of the creation because of what he is seeking and what he is carrying and what he is striving for. And the hadith finishes with saying, the Prophet ﷺ said that verily the scholars, they are the inheritors of the prophets. There is no other inheritor of the Prophet on the face of this earth being mentioned in this manner. 
And the hadith said that verily the prophets, they do not leave behind as something to be inherited in terms of wealth, but rather they leave behind knowledge. And whoever takes from that knowledge, then he has taken something which is great and amazing. So you see, just from this hadith, it contains so many virtues pertaining to the one who is seeking knowledge. Because as we said, this is something which is very lofty, very virtuous. And therefore, the one that is going to seek this knowledge and carry this knowledge, he or she has to embody themselves with, with particular attributes and particular characteristics. Because the thing that they are trying to pursue and carry is so virtuous. So from them, the first of them, what do you think the first of them would be? If you look to the books of hadith, for example, the books of hadith in general, they start with the hadith, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَّاتِ وَإِنَّمَا لِكُلِّ إِمْرِ مَا نَوَى That actions are tied to their intentions, and everybody will get that which they intended, right? So likewise, if you are seeking knowledge because it's an act of worship, you have to intend. You have to have an intention, a pure intention. وَمَا أُمِرُوا إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُوا اللَّهَ مُخْلِسِينَ لَهُ الدِّينَ they were not commanded except that they worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sincerely alone, seeking His pleasure alone. So the niyyah, the intention, is azmul qalb ala al fi'l al ibadah, taqarrabun ila Allah. The intention is that the heart contracts or commits to doing an act of worship as a way of drawing close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the niyyah has two parts niyyat al ma'mul lahu wa niyyat al ibadah. The niyyah of who you are doing the act of worship for and what actually are you doing as an act of worship. So what we're talking about is the first part, not the second part. The second part you will discuss in the lectures of fiqh. But here we want to know about niyyat al Who are you intending to please with this act of worship? So this intention, the student of knowledge and the scholar, they would struggle with it till the day they, till the day they die. Why? Why do you think they would struggle with it more so than everybody else? Yet they are doing something which is so virtuous. Because shaitan, he doesn't come to a broken house. Shaitan comes to the house which is beautifully built. The broken house, there's nothing there for him to take. But the house which is decorated with beauty, that is the one he wants to destroy. So he would chase the student of knowledge. And he would chase the scholar continually, trying to corrupt their intention. Because if he's able to corrupt the intention of the student of knowledge then he has brought much damage to the ummah. He has brought much harm to the ummah. So you will find that shaitan will sit on the path of the student of knowledge and continually say to him, look at you, wow, you've learned so much now. You're so amazing. People love listening to you. They love the way you give your lectures. You should be treated in a very special manner. When you go to give lectures, people should pay you. They should put you in the five-star hotels. They should send you business class, not in economy class. You have the right now to give fatwa. You should debate with scholars. You are the one that people should listen to. Shaitan will come with so many ways to corrupt the intention of the student of knowledge. To try to make him arrogant. And try to make him one who causes this lofty thing to be blemished, as we said. So it's extremely important that the one who is seeking knowledge remembers this. That shaitan won't leave him alone. He will continue to pursue him. And he will come to him at every stage of the path in seeking knowledge. So the person has to be extremely careful. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he mentioned in the hadith which was collected by Imam Ahmad and others, and Imam Al-Hakim said that it's authentic, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, man that this person who seeks knowledge, the type of knowledge which is sought for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but he seeks it for a reason of the world, like he wants to get a particular job. So he wants to get the knowledge because he wants to be given the position in a particular place. Or he wants the people to praise him. So he seeks it for a worldly reason only, then this person will not find the fragrance of Jannah on the Day of Judgment. Meaning he won't come close to Jannah. Because he took something which was so beautiful and lofty and he did it only for the sake of the creation. So you have to be extremely careful with the intention when seeking knowledge. Imam Ahmed, he said in one of his statements, 
Al-ilmu la ya'diluhu shay liman sahat niyatuhu. That knowledge, nothing can be comparable to it for the one whose intention is correct. So he's speaking about the nafl, the supererogatory deeds, not the obligatory deeds, right? Nothing can be comparable to seeking knowledge for the one who perfects or uh, beautifies his intention. He said, That this person who's seeking knowledge, his intention after pleasing Allah is to remove ignorance from himself and to remove ignorance from others. Not think more than that. Imam Malik once said, I wish that people could take this knowledge from me, yet not know who it came from. Can you imagine? This Imam of great importance and an ocean of knowledge. To him, he didn't care that people know his name. He was saying, I wish they could take my knowledge, yet not know who I am. But today, what do we see? Anybody who thinks they're a student of knowledge, they have to open a Twitter account. They have to be on Facebook. They have to ensure that they have thousands and thousands of likes. That's their main goal and objective, is to see the, the count going up and up. But the true seeker of knowledge, he doesn't care. His objective is only to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to ensure that people are coming closer to Allah so that they can please Him and worship Him in the correct way. So having the intention is something which is extremely important. And the person has to rectify his intention from time to time. The person has to hold himself to account. Because as we said, it's very difficult for the student of knowledge and the scholar for many reasons. One of them is that the student of knowledge, because people tend to love that person who is imparting knowledge, they will treat him differently. They will treat him with a type of respect not given to others. And that is good. And that is something which is sought. And so the person can become used to never being told that you are doing something wrong. So then the person becomes slightly arrogant and always thinks that he is right. Always thinks that it's his opinion which is the correct one. Always thinks that he should be treated in a particular manner, in a special manner. So you have to fight this in yourself. If you find yourself when you are seeking knowledge, giving dawah, that this whispering comes to you. That look at me, how much knowledge I have. Why well, the people should treat me special. I am the one they should come to. Why is my class empty and the other person's class is not empty? These kind of things you have to fight and not allow to enter into your heart. Taib, the second important characteristic that the student of knowledge must have is that he must have the taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What do you understand by the word taqwa of Allah azza wa jal? Taqwa comes from what we know to mean wiqaya. Wiqaya is like a protection. It's a shield. And you are protecting yourself from harm which is coming to you. And what it means in this context, it means that you are protecting yourself from the sins. You stay away from sins because the sins are harming your deen. And they are harming the dunya. Okay, so one of the companions, he said, taqwa is like when you walk on a thorny path. You are very careful of where you put your foot and you wrap your clothes around you to protect yourself. Likewise, the one in his religion, especially the one seeking knowledge, he's very careful what he does with his actions. He doesn't want to displease Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah says in Surah Al-Fatir, That very those who truly fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from amongst the creation are those who have knowledge, the ulama, the scholars. Why? Because you see the alim, he's spending most of his day looking into the Qur'an, looking into the tafsir of the Qur'an looking into the hadith which was mentioned by the Prophet Sallallahu looking into the explanation of the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu looking into the seerah, reading about aqidah, how to come close to Allah Azawajal, through belief and action. So he's continually surrounded by knowledge as though he has the companions and the Prophet Sallallahu in his company because that's all he's focused on is the words and the meanings of Allah and the Prophet Sallallahu So this, if he does it with a correct intention or she does it with a correct intention, will cause the person's iman to increase and will, will cause the person not to want to fall into sin al-ma'asi Allah says in the Quran Allah wa Allah wallahu bi kulli shay'in alim fear Allah have taqwa of Allah azza wa jal and Allah will teach you and he will give you verily Allah is with all things knowledgeable Allah is over all things knowing so if you want to have knowledge you have to have taqwa of Allah azza wa jal you have to be in a constant state of awareness of Allah Azza wa Jal. That Allah is watching you so you cannot deviate from the path of obedience. The more you have this, and the more you try to come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more Allah Azza wa Jal will give you from true knowledge. Because you have those people, they can gather a lot of information, but they don't really understand what that information is saying. So you see that when they discuss the Islamic text, 
They do it at a very surface level. And at times, sadly, it can be laughable, the conclusions that they come to, because they're just at a surface level. They're not able to understand it, the, the uh, objectives behind what they are reading. But the more you have taqwa of Allah, the deeper understanding Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you. And also, he will allow it to penetrate your heart and to benefit you. And that is the true objective of knowledge, right? As we said, Imam Ahmed said, to lift the ignorance from yourself and to lift the ignorance from other people. So many people, they may have knowledge, but they're not coming closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because the taqwa is not there. So the student of knowledge, he has to run away from sins like the plague. He has to look at the sin as a disease, something which is going to corrupt his journey. All this effort he is making in learning and she is making in seeking knowledge, if they fall into sins, then these sins is wasting what they are doing. Imam al-Shafi, we know he had a photographic memory. One day, a windy day, he happened to look upon the shin of a woman. He didn't intend it. The wind lifted up her dress slightly, her clothing, and he happened to look upon her shin. And he said, thereafter, I was unable to memorize the way I used to memorize. Before, when he would memorize, he would have to cover one of the pages because his memory would just, you know, take whatever's there. So that's how strong his memory was. Then his memory started to fade. So he complained to his teacher. He said, I complained to my teacher Waqi about the evil nature of my memorization. So my, my sheikh Waqi, he guided me to leave alone sins. And he informed me that verily knowledge is a light. And the light of Allah is not going to be given to the sinful person. You see, this is how they understood and this is what they experienced. That the more you stay away from that which is forbidden, the more you have taqwa of Allah, the more Allah will give you from knowledge. And the more you fall into sin, the less Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you. And so the student of knowledge, it's imperative for him and her to act upon what they are learning so that they may have taqwa of Allah. Listen to this hadith. In the Sahihain in Bukhari al Muslim, narrated by Usama ibn Zayd, Radiallahu anhu said that the Prophet sallallahu said, There will be on the day of judgment a man that will be thrown in the hellfire. And his punishment will be to the extent that his intestines will come out of his stomach. May Allah protect us. And he will be circling around the fire holding his intestines. Like a mule does when it's tied to a flour mill going round and round the mill. فَيَجْتَمِئُونَ عَلَيْهِ أَهْلُ النَّارِ so the people of the hellfire, they will gather around him. And they will say, مَا شَأْنُكَ يَا فلان? What is this situation that you're in, O so-and-so? أَلَسْتَ كُنْتَ تَأْمُرُنَا بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَتَنْحَانَ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ Was it not the case that you used to enjoin us with good and forbid us from doing evil? قَالْ كُنْتُ أَأْمُرُكُمْ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَلَا آتِيهِ He said, I used to command you to do the good and never do it myself. وَأَنْحَاكُمْ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ وَآتِيهِ and forbid you from doing evil, and yet I would fall into doing it myself. So look at the evil consequence of this situation. So on the one hand, we're saying that it's such a lofty journey, and such a virtuous thing for the person to seek knowledge. But if he doesn't have the taqwa of Allah, then this is where the person can end. We ask Allah's protection. Ameen. The next characteristic for the student of knowledge is that they have to have huge amounts of sabr. Seeking knowledge is not something which is easy. Allah makes it easy, yes, but it requires a lot of effort. It requires the person to continually revise what he is doing. It requires the person to continue research, to do lots of reading of the Quran, to do lots of worship with the Quran, to go to the places where knowledge is. When his friends are enjoying themselves and he's being called, he has to have the patience to say, no, I want to go and sit with my sheikh. I need to learn from my sheikh. And it's difficult because people will say to him, you're boring. You don't come out. You don't enjoy yourself. His family will say to him, what are you doing? All the time reading books, all the time researching. But he has to remember what he's doing it for. And that's why he has to have so much patience. You find that at times you hear successful people in life. Like recently, I, I heard a clip from a successful athlete. He was a famous athlete. He said, what I did in my journey to become who I became, I took everything in life as a benefit for me in my sport. So my food, my enjoyment, what he meant by his enjoyment 
that when he would socialize, he would socialize with experts in his field because he wanted to learn from them. So he wouldn't just go and mix with anybody. The food that he would eat, he would choose the correct foods. The time that he would spend with his family, it would be done playing sports that he was going to benefit from. The books that he would read would be about how to better himself as an athlete in his particular sport. So he became slightly obsessed. And that's how you will see that the scholar is and the student of knowledge is. Because they know how much reward is in seeking knowledge. They know how important it is and they know what it takes. The scholars, they say you have to give yourself, you have to give knowledge your everything and then you will get something from it. You have to throw yourself into the pool of knowledge and you will come out with something small. You can't get knowledge just by dipping your finger into the pool. You have to throw yourself into the pool. You have to ensure that you are occupied with that. Of course, it doesn't mean that you turn away from your family obligations. It doesn't mean that you turn away from seeking risk. We don't want to be like those foolish people. They'll seek knowledge, but they neglect their families. They seek knowledge, but they neglect seeking risk. No. You have to do everything in context. However, seeking knowledge requires that somebody has so much patience. One of my teachers, he used to tell me that when you go to the shop, memorize a hadith from the book that he gave me. And when you come back, revise the hadith. I never did so, sadly. But I'm just mentioning it to show you, look at his mindset. His mindset was, don't waste any time. You can do this. You can achieve the memorization of this book. But sadly, I didn't. But this was their mindset, and this is how they were able to memorize the Quran and book after book of hadith and seerah and aqidah. Sometimes you scratch your head. How do they memorize 10 to 15,000 hadith after memorizing the Quran? It's because they used what we call dead time. The time when you're sitting in the traffic, they've got the Quran open. The time when you're going to the shops, your wife is busy with the shopping trolley, you're sitting down somewhere, if she lets you, memorizing hadith. This is how the student of knowledge is supposed to be and not waste away his time. The Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith in Bukhari, Two virtues or two blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given the slave, most of mankind doesn't value them in the way they should be. That is free time and good health. Because when you have free time, you sit around doing nothing. And when you have no time, then you realize how valuable it was. Likewise with good health. When you have the good health and you can move around and go to the places you wanted to do, wanted to benefit from, you didn't go. But when your health starts to prevent you, then you realize how important that health was. So the Prophet ﷺ is reminding us that your time and your health is something which is extremely precious and you should use it to seek knowledge. One of the scholars, he said that for you to be a serious student of knowledge, then as a minimum, you should be reading 12 hours a day in the fields of knowledge that you are seeking, 12 hours a day, okay? And this reminds you of Imam Nawi rahimahullah ta'ala when he would attend 12 lessons in a day. He would attend 12 study lessons in a day and then after that he would go and teach and carry on living his life. So these people, when they spend so much time seeking knowledge, it's as though their time is given special barakah. May Allah make us from them, ameen. A very important characteristic of the student of knowledge is that he shouldn't let me read you the statement. That the one who is shy will not seek knowledge, nor is the one who is arrogant able to seek knowledge. Why the one who is shy not able to seek knowledge? He won't ask questions, right? He'll always be like hiding inside his thobe. And the one who is arrogant thinks he knows everything. No need for me to ask questions. The sheikh is wrong, I know. That's how some people are all the time. So the person seeking knowledge should always ask questions, should never be afraid of asking questions. The female companions, the Sahabiyat, they were from the most complete example of what shyness should be. They would never speak a word which was looked down upon. They would never have behavior which was lewd in any way, shape or form. Yet you have the Sahabiyat, Umm Sulaym radiallahu anha, she came to the Prophet sallallahu and she said, Ya Rasulullah, inna Allah la yastahi min al haqq O oh, Prophet of Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not bashful of the truth. So is there upon a woman to make ghusl if she has a wet dream? Look at the, look at the question coming from somebody who's so shy, right? How difficult that must have been for her to ask. But because it's pertaining to the religion, 
There's no shyness in the affairs of the religion, in the affairs of learning how to be close to Allah. So the Prophet said, Naam, ida ra'at al Yes, if she sees that she ejaculated, if she sees wetness. Okay? So the person should never be shy of asking questions. But the point is, how do you ask the question? The question has to be asked with manners. You find today so many people, they grab the Sheikh and they ask him such strange questions. The Sheikh already explained to you in the lesson if you were listening. Why are you asking the questions? And some of them, they ask the questions in a way to debate with the Sheikh. The Sheikh knows more than you think you know. You are deluding yourself thinking you know more than the Sheikh. Humble yourself and allow the filters of your cognitive tunnel to allow you to process what the Sheikh is saying. Many people, the reason they don't benefit is because when they're in the class with the Sheikh, every time the Sheikh is mentioning a point, his mind is going to thinking of things that he thinks he knows to refute what the Sheikh is saying. So he's not benefiting from anything the Sheikh is saying. So allow yourself to process what the scholar is teaching you or the student of knowledge is teaching you. And if you ask a question, then ask it for the sake of benefiting yourself or for the sake of benefiting others. Do not ask it for the sake of trying to debate the Sheikh or trying to think that you can show that the Sheikh has limits to his knowledge, which he does, of course, but not as limited as yours is, right? How should you ask the question? You shouldn't say Sheikh like this. You should say, Ya Sheikhuna, our Sheikh. Okay? And then you should make a dua for the Sheikh. Barakallah feek. Yarfa Allahu Qadrak. May Allah raise your rank and then ask the question. Okay? So there's a. Because why? Because the Sheikh, he's carrying knowledge. He's carrying that which is so virtuous. He's going to benefit with you with so much in this dunya and the akhirah. So you have to ask the question in a very respectful manner. Okay? Leading on from that is that you have to have, as part of the mannerisms, ihtiram al-ulama. You have to have respect for the scholars. Why? Because what did the first hadith mention about the scholars? Remember the hadith we opened up with? Inna al-ulama warathatul anbiya. That verily the scholars are the inheritors of the prophets. So they are the inheritors of the prophets. Like you would have respect for a prophet, of course not the same way, you have to have respect for a scholar because of what he's carrying and what he's uh, propagating from the knowledge of the Quran and the Sunnah. Sheikh Uthaymin in his Kitab al-Ilm, he quotes Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib radiyallahu anhu who said, مِنْ حَقِّ الْعَالِمْ عَلَيْكَ إِذَا أَتَيْتَهُ أَن تُسَلِّمْ عَلَيْهِ خَاصَ That from the rights of the scholar, if you go to him, is that you give him salam in particular. That you go to him and you give him salam if you are able to do so. And then give a general salam to the people. And when you sit, you sit as close as you can to the scholar. Alhamdulillah, you guys are doing the right thing because I'm not a scholar. You're sitting as far away as you can. <laughs> All right? But with the scholar, you do the opposite. Sit as close as you can because you want to get that nur and the barakah from him. And do not point to him with your hand. Do not point towards him. This is disrespectful. وَلَا تَغْمِسْ بِأَيْنَيْكَ And do not wink in his presence. وَلَا تَقُلْ قَالَ فُلَانْ خِلَافْ قَوْلَكَ And don't say in the gathering that your opinion is refuted because of such and such scholar. Don't you dare say that to the scholar when he's teaching you. He knows the other opinions, but he has the right to choose the opinion to teach you. Okay? You can say it to him outside of the class, have a discussion with him, but not whilst he's teaching. This is something very disrespectful. To say, Ya Sheikh, but what about this opinion and that opinion? As though you are trying to debate him. And don't yank him by his clothing. And don't keep on asking him questions. Badgering him. Give the sheikh a, a chance to breathe. For verily he is like the ripe palm tree of date. And those dates are continuing to fall upon you. Meaning that you are benefiting from him every time he, you are in his presence. You are benefiting him from things which will benefit you in the dunya and more so in the akhirah. From the respect of the scholars is not to do character assassination of the one who disagrees with your sheikh. So if you are attached to a sheikh in the sense you are taking from him, but you know there is another sheikh who is in disagreement with your sheikh over an issue, don't get into this character assassination. This is not for me and you to go around and say such and such sheikh is off the manhaj or is uh, misguided, etc. This is for the scholars to deal with. Let them 
decide who is guided, who is not guided, because they have the knowledge and also they have the taqwa, meaning that they won't do it for the wrong reasons, and they have the mannerisms. We, we will do it for the wrong reasons. We will hear that somebody said something about our sheikh, and that will infuriate us and make us misbehave. Okay? So it's not for us to get into that. And respect of the scholars should never lead to veneration of them in a way which is beyond the limits. We shouldn't be like the extreme Sufis who believe that scholars, they have hidden knowledge, that they have hidden conversations with the Prophet ﷺ, and they receive secret knowledge and this kind of stuff. What did Allah say to the Prophet ﷺ? قُلْ إِنَّمَا أَنَا بَشَرٌ مِثْلُكُمْ يُحَا إِلَيَّ أَنَّمَا إِلَاهُكُمْ إِلَاهُمْ وَاحِدٌ the best of creation, the closest there is to Allah Azza wa Jal, none closer, was told by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to say, say to the people of Muhammad that verily and certainly and absolutely I am only like you. And Ibn Jarir Tabari in his tafsir, he said, قُلْ يَا مُحَمَّدْ لِهَا أُولَاءِ الْمُشْرِكِينَ إِنَّ مَا أَنَا مِنْ بَلِي آدَمْ مِثْلُكُمْ Say to them that I am like the sons of Adam, like yourselves. And there's no knowledge for me except that which Allah gave me. So Allah is telling us in the verse that say, O Muhammad, that verily I am like you, except that I have been given revelation. So if Muhammad وسلم, has that humility told upon him, and, it's, and he's telling us that whatever he receives is revelation from Allah, so then who after him? Don't venerate people in such a way thinking that you can go to the graves when they are dead, like one of them claimed, and now he's a famous politician in Pakistan with maybe a million followers. He claims that Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah ta'ala, for the last 15 years has been teaching him in his dreams. Come on. Get off this. This is over-veneration of the scholars and understanding from them that which no logical person would accept and understand. So we have to keep our veneration and our respect and love of the scholars within the bounds of how the companions would respect the Prophet wasallam and how the Tabi'een, the students of the companions, would respect them. Okay? Also, from the manners and the characteristics which are extremely important for the seeker of knowledge, that he seeks knowledge in an organized manner. He has to go to his sheikh and take the advice of the sheikh, sheikh, how should I traverse on this path of knowledge? And this is like any field of knowledge that you go to in the dunya. When you want to become a student of law or medicine or anything, you don't do it by yourself. You don't decide which books you're going to take. You don't go to the year five book in year one. Likewise in knowledge. In knowledge, the ulama, they said, Man al usul, faqad al wasul. The one who is forbidden the fundamentals of knowledge, then he is forbidden from reaching the goal. And that's true. Sometimes people, they go and they quote from the book of Imam Ibn Qudama al-Mughni, which is known as an encyclopedia of fiqh. This is for somebody who is a high level of scholarship or student of knowledge. Yet you find somebody who can't speak a word of Arabic looking into that book. What are you doing? It's laughable. It's like you're going to year five. We said of the last text that you will take before you take your medical examinations and you're just enrolled into the course. Don't do that. You will waste your time and you will never achieve the objectives. So the ulama, they will tell for you and they will de uh, decide for you what books you should study, what you should memorize and how you should progress with tadarruj, step by step. مَنْ رَامَ عِلْمَ الْجُمْلَةً ذَهَبَ أَنْهُ جُمْلَةً Whoever tries to take knowledge in one go, it will disappear from him in one go. The ulama, they say, and this is the reality. Because you will end up confusing yourself and you will just become the laughing stock of YouTube as many people are. They just pretend that they're a sheikh and when they're not and they just make a mess of everything. From seeking knowledge, and we're coming to the end inshallah, but there are so many beautiful characteristics and mannerisms. I've just selected a few important ones. But inshallah, this will encourage you to go and study further. From the mannerisms and important mannerisms of seeking knowledge, that you have to be careful what you take into your body and mind. Be very careful of the type of food that you eat and the amount of food that you eat. Imam Al-Qurtabi in his book, at tadhkirah he said, I advise you, O oh my brothers, to go to the graveyards so you can take counsel, so you can take a lesson from the dead. But then he said, but do not go so on a full stomach. Do not go so on a full stomach. Why? When your stomach is full, you're not paying attention. You're half asleep. You're lethargic. And likewise, when you're seeking knowledge. Likewise, when you're doing anything. When you're working, when you're trying to be an athlete, anything. They tell you that the more energy you will have, the sharper your mind will be, is when you have less food. 
Okay, so the student of knowledge has to be careful of when they eat and how they eat. Okay, and also they have to be careful to ensure that their body has a right upon them. The more you exercise, the more you will know that you have the ability to concentrate for longer periods of time. Allah mabarak. Lahu. Okay, so it's important. Imam Tirmidhi, he collects the hadith from the Prophet Sallallahu where the Prophet Sallallahu said, uh, that the son of Adam doesn't fill a vessel which is more evil than his stomach. The worst thing you could do is to fill your stomach in terms of health and in terms of what it will do to your productivity. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, then the Prophet ﷺ said, Hasbu ibn Adam akalatun yuqimna sulbahu. It's enough for the son of Adam that he has morsels of food which will keep his back upright. But if he wants to go beyond that, beyond the few morsels, then there should be a third for his, a third of his stomach for his food, a third of his stomach for his drink, and a third of his stomach for his ability to breathe. Right? If you don't leave that ability to breathe, your breathing will be terms of burping on everybody in the vicinity. So you have to keep some space and not overeat and not become lethargic. Tayyib, some of us are going out after the class to have a bite to eat. Does that mean you can't enjoy yourself and fill yourself? No. At times, once in a while, that's the key point, once in a while, you can eat a bit more. From the hadith of Abu Hurair radiallahu anhu, when the Prophet sallallahu gave him milk and told him to give it to the companions. And Abu Hurair was starving. At the end of serving 70 or so companions, Abu Hurair was told to drink from the milk. This was a miracle of the Prophet sallallahu And he drank, and then the Prophet said, drink more. And he drank, he said, drink more. He said, I cannot take any more. Which means that he filled his stomach to the brim. And from this, the ulama, they say once in a while, you can fill to the brim. But the student of knowledge should be careful that in general, his diet is a good diet. Also, very important to finish with, that from the manners of the student of knowledge, that he calls to the knowledge that he has learned and acted upon. Allah Azawajal says in the Quran, قُلْ هَذِهِ سَبِيلِي أَدْعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ عَلَى بَصِيرَةٍ أَنَا وَمَنِ اتَّبَعَنِي Say that this is my path, O Muhammad. I call to it based upon clear knowledge, clear guidance, clarity. Me and those who follow me. So like Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala said, if you are a follower of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa what are you doing? You are calling to that which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa called to. If you find yourself in life that you are not giving da'wah in one way or the other, it doesn't have to be in this manner. There's so many other ways which are beneficial. But if you don't find yourself giving da'wah, then you are not truly following the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because he said, Ana me and those who follow me. So it's extremely important to, to teach others once you have learned and acted upon it. The Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith in Muslim, Man dalla a khair, man dalla ala al khair, falahu ajru fa'ilihi. That the one who guides to good, then he has the reward of the one who does that good. So you taught somebody Surah Al Fatiha. That person acts upon it. You get the reward of every salah that you taught him because he couldn't pray without Surah Al-Fatiha. Then he goes and teaches somebody else because of what you taught him. Then he goes and teaches somebody else because of what you taught him. So it's, what's that word? When it, is it cascade? When it just keeps coming down? It just keeps going further and further? This is what you are doing with your reward. See how virtuous it is to learn knowledge and to teach it? That every time you teach somebody something, every time they act upon it, you benefit, you get the reward also. And then they will teach somebody else and you also get the reward. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa As I said, there are so many more virtues and very important characteristics and mannerisms, but this isn't the place for that. But do go ahead and look into the books that speak about that. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa anything which was correct was from Allah azza wa jal, mistakes and shortcomings from myself and shaitan. If you have any questions, then feel free.